Hey everybody, it's me, it's Steve Simonson, and guess what? I've got a special guest waiting in the green room back there. You may have even got to take a look at him. I'm going to introduce him here in just a minute. But uh, here we are to, to, again today with another Awesomers.com podcast episode. This one is episode number 189 uh, for those keeping score at home. And uh, we're, we're joined by a special guest today, Yanni Kosminski. Did I get that right, Yanni? You did, you did. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Now, your company, Multiply Me, uh, am I pronouncing that one right? Because it's got really interesting spelling. It does. So it's Multiply Me with the N double I. Um, you know, it's pretty hard to come by those domain names these oh, days. Oh, boy. Domain names are like the uh, bane of my existence. So I, yeah. I love that. So let me let me let you give the Awesomers uh, crowd out there a, a little bit of a background about yourself. Where, where did you come from? Uh, you know, how, how did you get into this business or when did you start this business? Sure. Uh, it's been a bit of an interesting journey for me. And, you know, when you talk about startups, you can't really look at what the business is until you look at the history behind the, the individuals and the teams that make them. So for me, my journey started in Australia. I don't know if you're picking up the accent, but uh, Australian born and raised and lived there until I was into my late 20s. And my career in Australia was working in I've, been, I've spent the better half of about 10 plus years now in digital marketing and creative advertising. So my background has always been, I kind of grew up in the age of digital in the sense that there was no social. Like the first account that I ever worked at, at the first agency I worked at was Mercedes Benz and they didn't have Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or Pinterest. I launched them. So it was working with the legal team over in Mercedes Benz, trying to explain to them that it's actually safe for us to be on social. And if we're not there, we're left behind. So, um, yeah, that those was, must that have was... been really interesting conversations. I, I this is exactly why uh, corporate would not work for me because I would just want to punch the lawyer in the face and go, "Just <laughs> shut up and do what I'm telling you to do." Yeah. Yeah. So, is that how the conversations went? How many punches were thrown, Yanni? That's the question. Uh, you know what? I was usually me getting hit because they just weren't <laughs> happy. <laughs> they weren't happy with me sitting in the office trying to explain to them what uh, what a Facebook me you know what a Facebook post was or what buying media was but yeah um left there black and blue and it took uh, probably the better half of six months that we got over the line and mercedes-benz quickly grew to the the largest social following in australia for the automotive industry and i think it's probably an accolade they still hold today so very very you know it's, it's mercedes -Benz. It's nice yeah that way i mean yeah. they got a pretty good brand to start with but honestly they could have also fumbled the ball right and they could have uh, completely messed it up. So a as you got that kind of corporate background, where did you go from there? Yeah. So the, so the agencies I always worked for, or two agencies that I worked for the first in Australia, it was, I was the 10th employee and we grew to about 40. So I I've had in both instances and I'll tell you, so I actually, I moved to the U S so, so before I moved to the U S um, everything was digital. So it was SEO, web design and development, content creation and the likes of that. And, and, um, I got to a point in my career where I was, I knew there was more out there in the world. And, um, you know, America is the biggest stage really for the consumer market outside of, you know, China or India. But in terms of that had a, an appeal to me, I said, you know what, I'd give it a shot. And I went over to the US and lo and behold, I managed to secure a professional sponsorship over there. And I worked for a creative ad agency called Something Massive out of Los Angeles. And so, um, despite the name, they were about 10 to 15 at the time. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, they, 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 the ego alone has to be pretty, uh, pretty healthy to name your company something massive. Yeah. Well, you know what? I think it was sp supposed to be ironic initially. Like there was three of them. So they're like, well, we're something <laughs> massive. And then, you know, they, it, it, it grew and they did really well. And it, it turned, it, you know, it, it became, it went from um, three to... 45 and hey tell i'm in the middle of the um <laughs> that's all right so, As we, yeah, like, yeah. we call that ambiance yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um no we just had a little chat about it um but anyway um we went it went from three to about 40 i think in you know in in its um in its biggest uh you know when it got to kind of its peak and over there i was working i was the senior manager for strategy and engagement and i was pitching and winning clients like mastercard and sony Medtronic. Uh, I launched A2 Milk, which is a billion dollar milk company you might never have heard of. Um, I but, actually um, buy that brand of milk at Costco, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, I mean, it should, it should be there. And it's uh, all about the beta casein proteins. We can have another chat about that another time. But um, I guess my, my, my whole career has always been centered around uh, kind of the SME in terms of the size of the business I've worked in, working with large corporates. So it's been a very interesting kind of uh, position to be a part of, to grow up with these agencies and work with, you know, the, the biggest conglomerates in the world. And it's kind of seeing how they do it versus how we did it. And, and yeah, and so after that, yeah. No, I like that. Up. So let me just jump in. I like that because, first of all, most SMEs don't even know what an SME is, which is a small to medium enterprise. And, and those of us that would be in that class, so in other words, if you're not Mercedes, you're not MasterCard, you're probably an SME. Um, that, that, you know, we're all, we have different needs, but having that perspective of the big corporate guys and how they do stuff and their resources or the fight over resources or the fight over legal, all of that is good contextual, a good background. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, you said that you got into the Amazon business at some point. I did. I did. So when I left the US, so I spent uh, three years in LA. And when I left the US, um, honestly, I was started doing a bit of freelance work, quickly started building a bit of an agency. And um, oh, geez, I hope no one's listening here that I've worked with. But you know, I, I kind of got to a point where I was sick of making idiots rich, um, to, to be quite frank, because I was getting a really small piece of the marketing pie. And, you know, I'd buy, be buying Facebook media, spending 100K a year doing 1.3 million. Um, nice. You know, I was having the, these huge impacts on a very small piece of the marketing puzzle. And I said, you know what? If you gave me the end-to-end -end supply chain and logistics and production, I'll handle the marketing. So I eventually met a couple of guys who had, a, a, I didn't realize at the time, but it was a pretty sizable Amazon store. They, they were doing about $2 million. And this is maybe three years ago. And I said, listen, you know, I, I'm happy to come in and consult. Um, and we managed to take it from two to five million in a 12 month period. And when I arrived on the scene, there was three or four guys handling the store where one would be doing graphic design and the next day he's writing copy. And neither of these guys are speaking English as their first language. So, I mean, it was pretty funny <laughs> to see them kind of keyword stuffing and doing some of the things that, you know, especially it evolves so quickly as, as you're probably well aware when it comes to Amazon, but we managed to build a team out in the Philippines. So, you know, what would have cost me, I'd say 60 to $70,000 to staff as headcount per month, I was doing for about 12,000. And for me, that was really the uh, catalyst that made me realize that if we could do this and save ourselves this much money and not compromise on quality, and, and I would argue even better quality than some of the people I've ever worked with, in my life at that point, um, it's going to be life changing for others. So that was kind of how Multiply Me was born. We identified or I identified a opportunity to say the offshore staffing model uh, historically is not done right. Uh, it's not done right because the issues that most people experience, it's not just finding talent. Like most of the offshore staffing usually comes from a recruiter, a recruitment background. So it's someone who's had a staffing solution and it's a very traditionally recruitment is very transactional it's all right i'm going to give you 20 percent of the first year annual salary you're going to stay in the role for three months and you move on and for me it's a broken system yeah. because no one's it's not win-win if you're incentivized like why don't i just keep placing people placing people placing people and not caring what happens after three months you know obviously at some point your client's gonna step up and say, listen, I'm just paying you all this money and no one's sticking around. But we, we realized that the challenge was really about where, um, how to actually onboard and how to actually uh, teach people how to give them that either that external HR function from an onboarding, defining KPIs and objectives, what does success metrics look like, performance reviews, everything that the, you know, everything that the big boys do um, is done for a reason. And yeah. For SMEs, it just, it's, it's a luxury item. It's things that you just couldn't dream of getting to unless you have 20 and 30 and 40 employees. It doesn't, it's not a, an important thing. But let me tell you, from my standpoint, human capital and the people you put in your business, there's nothing more important. And so we wanted to create a solution where we could help put top talent affordably into businesses that need it most. So this is really important. And it's actually kind of a paradox because the things that are most critical 
that indeed entrepreneurs would call luxuries. Like, I don't have time for that. I'm in the middle of doing this graphics or I'm in the middle of writing this listing. We don't have the luxury of this ethereal management Steve loves to talk about, right? All of these things like uh, building org charts or building SOPs that I like to harp on and on about. Nobody has time for that because they're stuck doing it, doing it, doing it in the business every damn day. And this is the ultimate problem, right? Because it's a paradox of time. You can't do both. You got to pick one. And the question is, are you going to pick the strategic, you know, grow it up and make a real business? Or are you going to pick the tactical, I'm going to do this until I drop dead. I hope I make some money, you know, and you cross your fingers and you carry on with your life, right? This is, this is the entrepreneurial paradox that is, is timeless and it continues on today. So I, I love to hear as you frame that problem that you see the problem very similar to, to me and really you may you may find this as a surprise, but those awesomers who listen regularly know that when a guest agrees with me, well, then they're obviously right. That's the point I'm getting to. <laughs> you agree with me, and that makes you correct. So I now should, I, I wish I'd got some notes beforehand. I would have just agreed with everything. <laughs> yeah, well, th- believe me, you're well on your way. So you're doing well even without the uh, inside tips. So a- as we frame this problem where entrepreneurs, they're kind of often stuck doing the wrong stuff. They don't have time to do the the, the right stuff. Um, how, how did you go about solving that problem in the business that w- with those fellows where you guys went from two and then grew it up to a bigger business with 2 million yeah. a year to, you said 5 million a year. Five million, yeah, right? five, yeah. Yeah, so that's correct. substantial growth. And you said you did it offshore without compromising quality. I want to emphasize that bit. This yeah. is too often. I'll, I'll come back to these points, but too often people go, well, I don't have the time and I don't have the money, so I'm just going to do the crappiest job I can do. And they jump on Fiverr and they think somebody for five bucks a, a gig or 10 bucks a day is going to be their COO or their head of logistics or whatever yeah, other nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the most ridiculous concept yeah. ever, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think, um, I mean, it's just like you're teeing me up and I'm ready to, to go into that because we've created, we've created the businesses we have today. Uh, based on these exact problems, like what, what we're seeing. So, so how did we build that? So I had, a, I would say a life changing moment for me or one of the, the something that catalyzed the, the idea, the reality that I live today. And, and as I sit with you with a business that started seven months ago, we've created about 30 to 35 new jobs, full-time roles already. And for me, like success metrics, isn't about the money we're making. I know it sounds a little bit like idealistic for me it's about how many jobs and how many people now have healthcare and social security and hmo and are putting food on the tables for their families that for me is success so um to answer your question um and to kind of go back to what that life-changing moment was i like most you know entrepreneurs spend so much time like i'm someone who spent 10 years in digital i know who i need i know exactly I know who my operations, ma- I know what my operations managers should look like. I know what my designers should look like. I know that I want them to have very strong UX, UI insights so that when I'm having a conversation with them, they can very quickly articulate, like I can articulate what I want and they can put it onto a piece of paper or onto a website. I need the right customers. Anyway, I, I know who I need. And what I found myself doing was interviewing people or looking at resumes or going around it 30 hours a week right? Where that's not my core business. I'm not a recruiter. I don't know, you know, I'm good. I would, I would say I'm probably a good hiring manager, but I'm not a recruiter. That is, that has never been my core business. I spent my first job ever as a headhunter for a year. And that was, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> um, but uh, to answer, to, to answer the question, like when I found Jason, who's now our head of HR and has built a similar business like this, my life changed. I started interviewing two to three hours a week and I would hire two to three people every single week that I needed when we were hiring. And so all of a sudden I freed up all of this space. So from uh, j- just to make sure we, we put a fine point on this from 30 hours of you reading resumes and screwing around and chasing, chasing the dragon, as I like to say, yep. you put somebody in place in HR who synthesized the whole thing down, brought you a couple rock stars, you interviewed them, you made a decision that's the difference between having an HR person who knows what they're doing and trying to do it yourself, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Like to, to kind of marry it to multiply me um, and 
you know, there's a lot, you know, you mentioned Fiverr, there's Upwork, FreeUp, you know, there's a million of these solutions and they're all good solutions, right? I'm, I'm never going to talk negatively about any of them. What, what we saw in the market was we would call ourselves kind of like a concierge in that everything's consultative. Like we have a consulting function of the business, which I'll help kind of elaborate on a few more of these problems that I think will interest you. But um, for me, the reality is that um, to be able to give people that end to end, like you don't need to, you don't need to micromanage someone and say, do this task, this task, this task, give them ownership and responsibility of what success looks like to them, help them understand what you're looking for and allow them to achieve it. Let them, you know, we make every single one of our team members read a book called Multipliers. Um, and it's a book by Liz Wiseman and it's a case study on people who are multipliers and have multiplying effects versus diminishes. And it's a very, very interesting read and it helps kind of, my favorite quote in the book is, are you a genius or are you a genius maker? And you know, I don't know. I don't know. I know. I see you nodding over there. I know for myself, I want to be the latter. I don't, I'm never, I'm never going to be the smartest person in the room, but if I can bring the smartest people in with the recruitment function that we have and unlock their, you know, untapped potential, then now we're talking here. And so to bring it all back when we talk about the, the, the entrepreneur, the startup, the, how do I get from point A to point B? It's all about the way our methodology is, how do I continue to remove myself from non-critical tasks? to work on higher level strategy. So it, it's, it, it's too often. Uh, let me just hop in here with you, Yanni. Too often entrepreneurs are focused on what other job they can do, right? That they're, they're looking at how many hours they have in the day. They're like, all right, I can do this, this, this. They're making big giant lists of things to do for themselves instead of figuring out what they shouldn't be doing. Right. And I, I talk about this regularly with the functional org chart concept where it's like, Mm -hmm. I start with what I hate to do first. It's like I am doing this yeah, out of necessity. Yeah, yeah. That's I don't what everyone, want to do it, right? That's what everyone should be doing, right? I, I think so because ultimately you're terrible at it. Let's be honest. No matter how great you think you are at it, you're not that good at it. Yeah, even, yeah. In your, even in the areas that you're actually passionate and that you have talent, there's usually somebody who's – there's always somebody who's better than you. And there also can be more sustainable than you can be because you got other things to do, right? The entrepreneurs have a whole business to run and you can't take the tactical time to go be the copywriter because you love copywriting. You can't yeah. take the time to go screw around with logistics or finance or whatever your, whatever your bailiwick is. You that have is to my, run that the is business. Me. That is uh, me. I can tell you about numbers, accounting. You, you, if you try and get me to balance a, a zero Good luck to you. Like I'm, I am terrible at a lot of things, uh, but there's a few things that I excel at and that's where I'm going to play to my strengths. I'm going to bring in. So, so to that point as well, you, you know, I think a lot of people, and this is what you also take from a book like multipliers is that um, people like to feel whether intentional or unintentional, they like to feel like the smartest person in the room. They like to have, they love the dependency and it's just, you know, I mean, everyone likes a bit of an ego boost of, a pat on the shoulder, like, wow, I couldn't have done it without you. Like, yeah, let's, let's be honest. It feels good. But I think when you kind of shift that mindset and you say to yourself, how do I give my team every ounce of the knowledge and teach them how to fish rather than giving them tactical executions so that you can achieve more? Like my, I mean, my day today as a, you know, as a founder of a company that's only been around for uh, such a short period of time, I, I live in a utopia. I wake up in the morning I work with my executive business partner or executive assistant, who's an absolute rock star. She's got a, she's got a degree in law and accounting and is a business owner in her own right. She's, she, she's run her own business. So I wake up, I get a briefing every morning. What, you know, what's on the cards today? What's happening in our consulting arm of the business? What's happening in the staffing arm? What's, what staff do I, you know, even for this, even for this uh, call, what do I need to look at before I jump on it? Like my life is, is a dream and it's not to gloat. It's to say that, you know, what we're trying to create here in a, as a business is how do I create this reality for everyone? Because it's really, if, if you give, if you, if you teach someone how to actually achieve this, then their potential becomes kind of untapped and limitless. Well, this is the point is it's an objective that can be achieved. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, First of all, it's kind of knowing that that reality can exist. And I've, I've sat with entrepreneurs around the world 
uh, and and I've seen them just be completely red faced, completely stressed. They they are living in a world of chaos. The more people they hire, the more work they do. In a really bitter twist of irony, and uh, you know, just that's the reality. And by the way, that's yeah. that's kind of a, a normal thing if you don't actually have training and processes. You know, every upgrade's a downgrade at first, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. All like of that. these things are are just true parts of being a business. And when you have the experience, you know what to expect. So you don't say to yourself, "I need to hire twenty people as quick as I can." You 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 set up processes. You set up a, a system for solving these problems. So I, I I really appreciate the way you guys have dealt with it, and and the fact that you have achieved now a certain level of predictability in terms of mm -hmm. your, at least your schedule, and that that just means you you capitalize on all the ex experience that you had. So. Uh, let's talk about a typical type of client that that comes to multiply me. Uh, tell us about you know what what do they look like and what are they looking for and maybe maybe or maybe not they're looking for the right stuff. I don't know. That's you know sometimes clients don't know what they're looking for and they ask for some of the wrong things. What what's your experience? Yeah yeah um, great question. So uh, for us you know multiply me started as a staffing solution and that is really that was at our core um, but. You know, um, I guess one of the secrets of our early success as well is that, you know, I brought a functional team across. So I brought my COO now, um, who I've worked with her for a couple of years. Same with our CIO, Chief Innovation Officer. He's effectively a management consultant running around our business, fixing things before they're even broken. Um, and it's a real luxury. Like we treat Multiply Me as a Multiply Me client from our consulting function. So... To answer your question, a typical client for us now um, and where we're kind of gearing towards is rather than just coming in and having a consultative approach, which we do, unlike a lot of these other platforms, where we'll talk to you about what are you actually trying to achieve? Like we have clients come to us and say, I've got five designers. I need another designer. You know, we staff a lot of agencies. We staff a lot of Amazon sellers. We have companies of all sizes, really. And, you know, some that have been around for 25 years, some that have been around. For us, the sweet spot really is I, we love to deal with companies before they've made all the critical errors and built on a weak foundation and just keep throwing band-aid solutions. Like in my, my dream client is someone who's got a great idea. They've started to build a bit of a team and they don't know where to go next. And so that's where we kind of step in here. And now consulting function, like the, 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 the dream solution is this. We come in and we assess the business and its current state. And audit is a very taboo word and not very sexy. Um, but we'll audit the current state and all that does is it lets us understand like where does your systems and process sit on a scale of one to five where's your scalability at where is your organization at we've got a few different metrics and you know I'd be happy to show you all the slides but I don't think this is the forum for it and essentially we'll kind of help people assess where they sit today what are some key findings around the strengths and weaknesses of the business what are some quick wins, low hanging fruit? What are things we can do today or they can do without us to, to start to create systems and process and efficiencies to allow them to scale. And so what typically happens is we come in there and every client that we've worked with today, we've saved them a ton of money to the point where the last client we worked with in our steering committee midway, which is typical of any consulting engagement, also very, uh, scary word um you know, <laughs> yeah for, for all... audit and steering committee boy you really uh you know how to catch the flies with honey over here yanni yeah, i'm gonna give yeah, you a little marketing yeah. lesson here later but yes. no i'm with you now, once we agreed to the audit now you got a steering committee go ahead i'm, I'm really buckled up for good times <laughs> so so let me let me alleviate your concerns and let you know that our entire team is based out of the philippines and so i think much like some of the businesses that you're involved in and what i've been able to kind of uh, do a bit of snooping around you is that you also have that cooperative, collaborative approach of how do we help other SMEs, small businesses, entrepreneurs actually get to the next stage. So for us, unlike you know, McKinsey or Accenture or KPMG, we're not here profiteering. Um, and sorry if anyone who works for them is, but it's, it's, the, it's the sheer cold hard facts around it. We are here and we're never gonna charge $100,000, $50,000, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for engagements that we can deliver for thousands of dollars. For us, that's the access point and the catalyst to say, let's get you on the right path. Let's help you understand where you sit, where you lack in the business. If you want, we'll implement your standard operating procedures, your process, your internal workflows. We'll fix 
what either is broken will come in, we'll do your digital transformation. We're here to kind of unlock the, you know, the potential of what is likely a, an incredible business that may not be running as efficiently as possible. Or, you know, just like you were saying before about one step forward, but then you create a lot more work when you onboard people. For us, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. We, we have like um, rounds. So we've hired three new people this week and everyone starts on next Monday, right? Everyone goes through the onboarding process through our COO and HR department. Like when, by the time my designer will be ready to work with me, she's already ready made. I, I literally just have to say, hey, here are, the, here are the deliverables. Here are the timelines. If we agree, let's go. Like it's, um, it, we found a way to scale the, the most important part of your business in human capital. And this is how all the big boys do it. For sure. And I, I just want to share with everybody that this is the exact way you scale a company. So, uh, you know, I've had operations in the Philippines and we, we would do the, the different waves, right? The different uh, hiring waves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, you know, wave one was nine or 10 people and, and wave two and wave three. And they would actually, they didn't actually use the word wave. They would have uh, round or higher. Yeah, There's like group. I don't remember the exact nomenclature. But basically, they're like, oh, what, you know, what class are you in? Are you in, oh, you're from mm -hmm. class two. Wow, I'm in class, you know, 18. That, that's amazing. And there's, a, you know, that, that was hiring, you know, 10 plus people a week for many weeks in a row to build uh, a, a fairly reasonable sized company in the Philippines. And that was a, a number of years ago. So all of this, you know, I agree and endorse every part of this premise, which is have an HR function, have a kind of a, a, a functional onboarding uh, concept to get the people ready to, to go. And then uh, as you bring them on and you set objectives, get the buy-in, agree on the objectives, the deliverables, the timing, et cetera. That's what kind of makes people feel comfortable. That's how you get the best out of people. And it sounds like that's kind of how you guys do stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, to a T. I mean, I'm sitting here now. We, I have an org chart of what our company looks like today. I've got, I've got exactly how many people we need in different functions for Q3 and Q4, 2021, as the business expands. I mean, um, when you look at how traditional businesses start, and I think that moving to this part as you start a business might, isn't actually the smartest way to do it. So there's two ways to grow a business, it's either through humans or through systems. And I think you need to have enough time in market as a, as a human trying to figure out what's going on before you take the step to automate, systemize, productize, whatever it is you're delivering, be it product or service, because until you have the kind of in-market data, um, you could go off on this crazy tangent of building a whole business that doesn't actually have a direct appeal or a need. So I guess to, to kind of build on that point is invest the time to learn quickly. And once you're kind of onto something, then is the time to say, okay, Let's build the system around it. We've, we've got our, POC, our proof of concept where we're ready to go and then iterate. And, you know, and it becomes this snowball effect. And I'm experiencing it right now. And even businesses we're already working with are experiencing it at the same time, which is, which is really cool to be just kind of one step ahead of the growth trajectory. So, so I, I like all of this, Johnny, and I want to just, again, try to uh, put you know, the, the points uh, in, in the bucket the way I see them. So first of all, we have this reality that people need help and they need help in two different ways. I, I quite agree that, by the way, that as you're experiencing the, the thing as a, as a human first, then you understand how to build a system, or at least you understand what's broken. That should lead you towards what the solutions look Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Um, when, when you guys look at it, you said you have the staffing side and the consulting side. And the consulting sounds like, hey, I've got this issue. I don't know what to do with it. It's it's some kind of problem that I have or some kind of solution that I'm seeking. Uh, is that kind of the premise of a, a consulting engagement? Yeah. So, so we haven't even put our website live yet. We're literally just finishing the branding um, because it's all been done through multiply me today, but uh, soon we're going to have a company called Escala, uh, Escala consulting, which is scale in Spanish. And we will kind of, I mean, multiply me and, and Escala, it's, it's one and the same in terms of what we're delivering, but they don't, you don't need to have both. So if you're just looking at staffing, then we don't need to go down this long winded process of doing an audit, understanding the business. Like, you know, it's consulting is a very, um, 
sensitive topic, right? Like when you, when you talk about, you know, a, a word like consulting, it's literally like the way I, I would kind of, the analogy I would give is it's almost like having a therapist for your business. And so when you come in, it's kind of like a doctor patient relationship where, where, you know, someone's coming in and they're saying, I've got these issues in the business. Um, and it obviously helps when people are honest and they feel comfortable. So, you know, you play this fine line of like everything you tell us is going to help us build a framework around how we help you further. So, so uh, there's a plenty of entrepreneurs who have this reality, right? There, there's some issue. Maybe the growth isn't as high as they want it. Maybe the, the COVID uh, coronavirus stuff has, has whacked them. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why you need somebody to help you. And this is actually when you need a consultant. Uh, the, the fact that you guys are kind of right sizing this consultant uh, offering to, you know, the Amazon community or uh, e-commerce community or what have you. In other words, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the Mercedes Benz that we talked about earlier. It doesn't have to be MasterCard. You can be a guy. You can be a guy with a couple other guys or gals, right? And you don't have to be this multinational global thing to engage you guys. That's what it sounds like to me. Am I right? Well, yeah. So, yeah. So our typical engagements range anywhere from, you know, just to be totally transparent, anywhere from small projects like $2,000 to, you know, maybe five, dollars $10,000. Like these are engagements that if you were to go to EY or Accenture, you're looking at minimum buy-in of a hundred thousand to a million two and five million dollars and for us um it's so disproportionate like when you talk about the one percentile and and the rich um it's the same with corporations right so you know accenture have seventy thousand people deployed in the philippines all of the biggest companies in the world are finding incredible talent in all of these countries and paying you know paying a fraction of the prices that you and i are typically paying and we're supposed to compete with them even though they already have the resources and even though they're delivering more cost effectively. So for us, it's about how do we level the playing field? How do we give the businesses that need the services most at a price they can afford? You know, generally speaking, you have a consultant who spent time 10 years in one of these companies. They come in and they say, yeah, sure. My day rate's $2,000 and you get, you know, you get really excited. You do the $2,000, you have the day. They're like, here's your strategy. And, now I have no idea how to deliver it. And you want me to engage you and do the study? Yeah, it's another 10 grand. Like it's just, it's just so cost prohibitive. And the value is, is definitely there. But it, as in even at the higher price points, you, you need it. But I think what we've come in to do is we've said enough's enough. Like we don't need to charge these prices because if we're going to help a business uh, get to where they need to, then they're going to need staff and we're going to have affordable staff. And we're going to be able to help staff them. And so for us, it's about how do we go on this journey with founders, SMEs, and at every level, take them to the next level and the next level, like, a, a, you know, a startup having an exit is the biggest feather in our cap. So it, it becomes a very beautiful business model in that it always has to be win-win. If we're not delivering, then you know, then everything we stand behind kind of folds down. So yeah, we built out, it that way. Yeah. yeah, results really do matter. So uh, just to, we're, we're running out of time here, Yanni, but uh, so we understand now that the consulting bit is where you have a specific problem or a, a situation you want to solve or maybe an expansion opportunity you're considering and you just need somebody to ride shotgun with you. You need mm -hmm. somebody. That's a very American way of saying it. But yeah, uh, yep. uh, you lived in America. You can figure it out. And for the rest of you, go Google it. Uh, the point is you need some help and you don't know where that help's going to come from, but you need high talent and access to talent. So that's the consulting bit. Uh, on the staffing bit, how does that work in, in a typical thing? Give me a, the, the two minute summary of that. Yeah, typical engagements look like this. We'll, we'll have a free consult, call it a discovery call, where we'll talk to you about who you're trying to staff. So I gave, I'm going to stick with the example of the designer. So let's say you've got an agency or you've got an Amazon business and you've got thousand SKUs and you have to be creating listing image after listing image after listing image. And there's a lot of thought that goes into these images, right? It's what are we trying to solicit from, or, or what, what emotion are we trying to create from each image? What journal are we, are we taking them on? So we have, we might have someone say, I need another designer. And we'll say, do you need another designer? What's the problem? And they'll say, well, I just can't deliver any of my projects. And we'll say, well, do you have a project manager? Didn't think about that. And we'll say, well, the project manager's function actually serves to make sure that they own the deliverables. So it's more, more of a consultative approach. We're actually going to give you advice on who you should look like. We walk away and our recruitment team builds the job description. 
the prospect at the time will define, they'll agree or disagree or make changes. And then we go off and we search and we do a lot of headhunting, recruitment. We have our own database, our own networks. Like we've worked hard to, to establish ourselves as a, as a serious player in the Philippines. And, and then what we'll end up doing is we give the top two or three um, talent. Like only if it passes our five rounds of, of interview and review, we might, inter we might review hundreds of candidates before we give you even the top two or three. For us, if they're not good enough to work for us, they're definitely not good enough to work for you. So we kind of take all the legwork out of it and then we build the onboarding plan. We work with you and we teach you how to be a better manager. It's not just about getting the best talent. If you can't work with them as, you know, we're, we're here to kind of help coach you along. We've got an onboarding team. We're always there for support. There's an account manager for you. So it's, uh, I guess, this, I, I think that answers the question. Yeah, it does answer. I mean, it really does paint the, the proper picture, which is, you know, hiring is when the, the, the reality begins, everybody, right? First of all, it sounds like you guys simplify the process. And, um, and I, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I want people to really concentrate on that process, right? They do all the heavy lifting. They show you the couple of rock stars. We kind of talked about this earlier with Yanni's uh, situation, and that saves you time and gives you higher quality candidates. Now, is your model, Yanni, that you plug them in as a full-time person, as a shared person? How does it work for you guys? Great question. Great question. So, you know, we have a, we have a bit of a social mission behind the business, as I, I've mentioned a little bit. Um, it's about creating jobs. So, for us, having someone, we want to kill the gig economy. Like, if anyone is serious about scaling their business, you know, it's about putting real people who are your team members into your business, not having a freelancer who goes MIA for a week and you don't have whatever, what business critical element you had. So we do, traditionally we aim for full-time 40 hours a week, but we also do part-time 20 hours. Um, and that's at a minimum because we don't see that you're going to get the level of effectiveness that we do unless you're doing at least 20 hours. And it also means that your employee isn't sitting there stressing out about whether their, ne where their next meal is or where their next client is. So it's also about like, I think one important thing to take away when we talk about this process is, you know, when you look at business, if your employee or your team member has a problem, then your business has a problem. And so this is a really surefire way to kind of stem some of the issues that I would say most people are unaware of, that they wouldn't even be thinking about on this wavelength. Yeah, that's, that's very uh, true. Now, do they actually work for the business or do they work for you guys as an agency once, once the engagement yeah. or once the, so, the deal is done? So the way, so the way it works is, um, you pay a like a retainer, so to speak. You pay a, a monthly fee to us, which might range just to give you some some ideas. It might range from about I would say the cheaper end. Remembering that we're not trying to put in, you know, anyone who says I need a VA, I need a I need someone who can do WordPress and design and use Elementor, and like that's not us. Like if you're looking for that jack of all trades, then you know, I, I can tell you <laughs> they don't exist. Stuff. But carry on, yeah. you're right. Yeah, they, exactly. That is, you're not going to get the real results. So. Um, what we do is we, cause for us, it's really important that they're fairly treated. So they become our technically employee, but it's dedicated to you. So you'd never have them split with other, like it is your employee. You manage the relationship. We're always there to hold your hand, but it's your employee. So we do also like upskilling. We have training programs that are related to your business, where we try and make your multipliers as we name them better. And it's it's all about how we continue to kind of add value. So anywhere from about 1700 to I'd say that the most expensive multiplier we have in today is about $3,000. And that's a full stack developer who has 10 years experience. Understood. So again, just to uh, help parse it out a little bit, they're, they're on your payroll. You're taking care of them. Do, do they report to an office? Are they virtual? How, how does it work over there in yeah. practical terms? So they work generally um, from home. Uh, we have had situations where we have them work out of the co-working space if they prefer it. It's really about like, I live my best life working from home every day. You know, in, in Manila, I'm sure it sounds like you're quite familiar. You know, people are commuting two hours each way every yes, day. Brutal. It's, it's just not living. I wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to have anyone that I work with do something. I wouldn't want to do this. Why would I want anyone? Why would I want to create that reality for anyone that we work with? So everyone works from home or from a co-working space and... We, we check in. So we do the performance management. We're actually making sure every day that they check in, they rock up to their shift. We make sure that that's, that's Australian rock up. 
Um, I'll look it up uh, later. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I also listen to the Aussie man, so I'm sure I can look it up. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the best, isn't he? He's fun, yeah. So, yeah. so I like this idea, and I'm going to just try to uh, bring it all in here. The, the, the key is you guys do the heavy lifting to find qualified people. You do the, the performance management ongoing to make sure they stay engaged, maybe even surface some of the problems with the crappy entrepreneur managers that exist, mm -hmm. which are going to be prevalent. I, I'm sure that you must see that as yeah. one of your biggest obstacles. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it, that's actually our biggest obstacle is we, you know, traditionally speaking, they say it takes about six months to get real ROI on, on your, you know, your new hire. And for us, we're trying to bring that back, right back down to about a month to six weeks. And I think we've cracked the code when we get a willing and able participant. So the biggest issues we have, we build a weighted scorecard custom built for the, the client. So based on what's important to them, we'll build a scorecard and they'll fill it up. They'll populate it. So will the multiplier. And at the end, we kind of facilitate like what's working, what's not. We do this after the first week, 30 days, three months. As frequently as you want, but I think after th every three months is enough, really, or every six months, or you know, you don't need to go into it too quickly, but too too frequently. But the point is, is like we're here to set you up for success and address issues that you don't realize you have. Like we'll give you recommendations on the continuity. You know, when we talk about virtual teams, which is you know we can talk about this all day with COVID nineteen and what that's done to the world, and that's a whole it's probably a whole other podcast for you. But, um, you know, in short, I think a lot of people are realizing that you can work with people all around the world. Um, you don't need to be sitting in the same office. So for us, it's really unlocking that potential of if I can get better talent for a fraction of the price and I can work with them remotely, why am I investing six figures on someone who's barely, you know, barely present in the business? Yeah, and always looking for the next opportunity. So I, I like this. I like the mission, uh, you know, putting people to work who are talented and diligent and want the opportunity. They appreciate it. You know, raising up entrepreneurs to be better managers because in general, entrepreneurs are terrible managers. And I'm, uh, you know, a self-confessing terrible manager uh, for everybody. I've, I've developed skills, so I'm not as terrible as most of you. I'll be honest. I'm, I'm probably better, but I'm still terrible. Uh, certainly yep. compared to professional managers, right? And that's yep. why in every business I build, I bring in people who are good managers at the beginning instead the most, of me having to do the, the most the, important hire. The most, yeah, like, like Joan, my COO, um, if she listens to this and I've said it a million times and I'll embarrass her again, but she's probably the most talented person I've ever worked with. Like without her, there is no me. And without me, there is no her. Like, we are, you know, you know, kind of yin and yang like that. Like she is, she has a, a mind that is so um, incredibly geared towards being the best manager and building the best systems and process. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm more aloof isn't the word I want to use here, but I'm more, you know, I'm interested in this and that and this and that. I'm a little bit more, you know, I would be more of the typical entrepreneur, but I identify my weaknesses and I would say anyone listening out there, Look at yours too and realize what you can and can't do and find the people to build around your skill sets. Don't well, try and don't try and be everything to everyone because it's just you, you, you're doomed to fail. We, we talk a lot about this. I've done the book review for the customers out there listening. Uh, focus on your strengths, right? Stop trying to bring up your weaknesses because you suck at certain things. You'll still suck when you're really great at those certain things compared to other people who love to do those things. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And that's actually how, how businesses scale. Uh, I've, I've given many examples on this podcast before about the people who are doing jobs that I think are essentially torture chambers for me, and yeah. they're in their happy place doing it, right? They, yeah. they are completely in love with this spreadsheet or this forecasting or whatever the nightmare is that I don't want to have to deal with. They're on it, and they love it, and that's how things actually work in the real world. So as we as we sum this thing up, first of all, Multiply Me is my understanding is an aligned and powery resource. Am I right about that, Yanni? Correct. We've oh. just joined and um, yeah, very, very excited about uh, yeah, getting, getting to chat and hopefully you know, getting really involved in, in what sounds like a very incredible community. Well, kudos to you guys on uh, taking that step. And uh, for the awesomers out there, listen, particularly empowering members and shareholders, make sure that you give a little bit of time and check out Multiply Me. This is going to be something... Uh, that I think is really important. And this is quite different than all of the other kind of j just general platform things or, you know, if you need a, 
whatever. I, I still think that there's room for gigs. If you don't have 20 hours a week of graphics work, you got to find somebody who can do that for, for sure. you on a for spot sure. basis. That's just a life. Um, however, as your business grows and you find those things, they are really, really important. And, and Yanni, I'm actually going to uh, encourage you to check out Parsimony. It's a full ERP system with mm -hmm. kind of all the project management. And we've got a new SOP thing built in that uh, you're, I, I think may be interesting. I would love to compare notes on how you guys are doing stuff versus how yeah. we're doing stuff at some point. I, I, would, I would love to do that. We're actually, I mean, it's, it's early days, but we're talking about taking all these learnings and building a SaaS solution on the back of it because we've, I've used Zoom, Loom, Trello, Asana, ClickUp, you know, you name it, I've, I've been there and done it. And I think we've got a pretty good system in place right now that we kind of roll out as, you know, the, 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 the now in vogue term is digital transformation. Um, oh, okay, good. I'll get on board with that. Uh, well, yeah. listen, it, it, the, the reality is, you know, when you can replicate a system and produce a predictable result at the end of every time you run that system, that's a good thing. Um, and I do want to thank you, Yanni, for joining us. Are you, are you actually, where are you calling in from today? So I actually sit in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, okay, nice. So I, yeah, so I've been here for three years, but I'm back and forth from the States. Actually, was at the White Label World Expo where I met Melissa, and that's how I actually even came across you guys. So, Love it. Uh, uh, well, yeah. it is indeed a small world. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, awesomers out there listening, I know we went a little longer than uh, normal here, but there's so much meat in here, and we could go a lot longer, I'll be honest with you. Uh, and I want you guys to digest it. I want you to get into it, and I want you to check it out. Um, and this is going to be at the awesomers.com slash 189 to see any show notes, details, or ways to get in touch with Yanni. Yanni, any final words of wisdom? Um, geez, you put me on the spot there to, to finish off. Um, I would, you know what, I'm going to give my favorite book recommendations. Um, you know, if we're about adding value, um, there's three books that I'm recommending at the moment. And if you speak to me in a few months, it might, it might change, but I would say for me, um, a life changing book was the seven habits of highly effective, uh, people by Stephen, Stephen R. Covey. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's the man. Um, the, the next one is multipliers and that is how you can understand if you are a multiplier or a diminisher and how you can combat it or whatever. And, and I think that that's something that really helps unlock the, the potential of you as a manager and the last book. Um, and this one I read recently and I'm, I'm borderline obsessed. Um, the sales acceleration formula by Mark Robage. So he is an MIT graduate who took the sale. He built the, the HubSpot sales team. So he took it from zero to a hundred million in three years. And it talks about how you break down people and how you build the best teams and talks a lot about the data and metrics and, and everything that you like. If you want to fast track to scaling a business, if you can follow a lot of the stuff he says, or those three books, you take those three books and I guarantee you'll be a different person on the other side if you can actually process all of the points that are inside of it. I love it. That's very strong takeaways. Awesomers out there listening, there's a uh, rumor on the street is that a couple of you haven't actually uh, left a review or shared this thing. And uh, I'm going to go Liam Neeson on you. I will find you. And uh, I've got a particular <laughs> set of skills. And I will make you pay if you're not sharing this, or you're not leaving five-star <laughs> reviews. That's going to happen. Uh, that's not even a joke. I know Yanni's listening. He's diminishing the seriousness of this situation. But I guarantee you, <laughs> I will so find scared. you. I will hunt you down. And uh, you will leave a five-star review. That's what helps keep the, the, the word spreading, everybody. Thanks again to Yanni. I appreciate the time, and I can't wait to learn more about Multiply Me. And thank you, awesomers out there. Keep doing what you're doing, everybody.